Hello everyone, my name is Francesco Del Rico, and I will be presenting uh, research done together with Dr. Abegao, who studied at the Federal University of Sergipe, did his PhD there, a study concerning the effects of ultraviolet light exposure on a class of materials called radiophotoluminescent. Uh, materials. These are silver-activated phosphor glasses. These materials are developed for radiation dosimetry purposes. Now, nowadays, radiation dosimetry is mainly performed, is, is widely performed, using electronic devices, because these provide high sensitivity and real-time response, which in turn are quite useful in order to optimize the procedures and minimize radiation exposures or radiation workers. An important element is the fact that workers can monitor their exposure and see immediately whether they can uh, optimize their procedures and reduce the exposure itself. One problem arises though with these devices and it's the fact that they're sensitive or may be sensitive to electromagnetic interference. So when they're used in a proximity of uh, metal detectors, card readers, or even devices for magnetic resonance imaging, typically uh, associated with uh, hospital environments, the signal on the devices may be lost or altered, which of course is unacceptable. That's the reason why for legal purposes, that is to provide so-called doses of record, we still rely on passive devices, solid state devices. And among these, the most widely used are luminescent um, detectors, stimulated luminescence detectors. These are insulated materials, crystals typically, whereby radiation promotes electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. But when they try to return uh, to the valence band, or rather recombine with the holes that they've left behind uh, upon ionization, they actually get trapped, some of them do, at intermediate energy levels that are present inside the forbidden band. They're introduced in the forbidden band by appropriately doping the materials, adding impurities to these materials. From these traps, the electrons can be released either by thermal or optical stimulation, following which they will recombine with the holes and emit light in a measure that is proportional to the amount of radiation that was absorbed. What you see on the right is an example of a fluorite, a very sensitive uh, material, very radiation sensitive material, and as you can see, the bottom photograph shows what happens when in the dark the material is warmed up and light is emitted. So these two categories, thermally stimulated and optically stimulated materials, have now reached fairly widespread acceptance and usage worldwide. There is another possibility of acquiring luminescent signal, and that is from materials called radio photoluminescent. Um, these are materials that were discovered a long while back, but have only become viable and uh, commercialized in recent times. Uh, these are typically phosphate glasses, doped or activated with silver ions. In this case, the radiation produces stable color centers. So contrary to the previous types of materials, the stimulation that is then um, used, and in this case, it's done by means of ultraviolet light, will not release the electrons from the trap, but rather will excite them to emit light, visible light. In the particular case of the silver activated phosphate glasses, that I'll describe, which are produced by a Japanese company called Chiyoda Techno. The light that is emitted is uh, orange, is bright orange. 
the trapping of the electrons is essentially permanent unless the devices are brought up to some 400 degrees Celsius for about an hour, in which case the material is annealed. The mechanism behind the uh, formation of these um, color centers is the combination of either electrons or holes with silver ions. The combination with, with electrons will produce neutral silver, whereas the combination with holes will produce silver 2 plus ions. These are both color centers. Those that derive from the combination with electrons are created rapidly due to the high mobility of the electrons. Those that are produced by combination with holes instead have a much slower uh, kinetics and the signal coming from them builds up more slowly over time. The emission from these two um, color centers is either blue from neutral silver or orange, as I was saying before, from silver 2 plus. And again, because of the much slower mobility of the holes that produce the silver 2 plus ions, the orange signal, which is much more intense than the blue signal, will build up slowly, typically over about one day for a complete buildup. So the two peaks one, uh, one is formed immediately, but it's not used for dosimetric purposes, and that is the blue emission, whereas the orange emission is the one that is typically used for dosimetric purposes. And that produces a very, very good uh, type of dosimeter, a dosimeter that has a very low minimum detection threshold in the order of a few microsieverts, so perfectly suitable for personnel monitoring. It also offers a very linear response all the way up to 10 sieverts. The material is very stable. There's virtually no fading, contrary to thermally stimulated materials that are, of course, sensitive to temperature or optically stimulated materials that are obviously sensitive to light, uh, these materials will not suffer from these environmental parameters. On the other hand, they are slightly hygroscopic. You see uh, on the left how the glasses look perfectly transparent when they're not exposed to ultraviolet light. And these are glasses that have received quite high doses all the way up to 20 gray. On the other hand, when they're exposed to UV light, typically around 360 nanometers is used for optimal uh, stimulation, you'll see a very bright orange emission coming from these devices. Now, these levels of sensitivity, microsiever levels, are possible with dedicated instrumentation, quite expensive. We built our own device. We built a laboratory uh, readout system, which, as you can see, comprises this uh, holder, this cubic box that holds the glass sample and exposes it to the stimulation source we're interested in. In this case, it's an LED. It's a 365 nanometer uh, emitting um, LED. It collects the light, either uh, sending it to a uh, spectro spectrometer or a silicon photomultiplier that is in here. The signal is then analyzed on a fast oscilloscope. And the results um, that can be acquired with our device are shown here. As you can see, the device uh, has a fairly good sensitivity down to some uh, hundreds of uh, milligrade, and it does produce a fairly linear response uh, to the expected levels. One reason we were interested in investigating these materials, and in particular stimulating them with ultraviolet light, is that we build films. We produce films with uh, grains of these silver, um, phosphate sil silver activated phosphate glasses. And these fields are produced and investigated 
for applications such as skin dosimetry and extremity dosimetry. Now, monitoring the exposure to the fingertips of radiation workers is quite important in a variety of situations. Uh, nuclear medicine interventional radiology procedures do expose radiation workers to significant doses. The nuclear fuel cycle industry also involves exposure to the extremities of radiation workers. Now, monitoring these exposures is not easy. Um, it typically is done with uh, passive detector chips, but these interfere with the tactile sense of the operators and therefore cannot be done uh, routinely. So we've thought about grinding the glass in small grains and dispersing them in films that we can manufacture as described in the uh, paper that is uh, mentioned here on the right. One issue that we were interested in tackling was the possibility of annealing the signal in these films. Of course, we cannot do it through heating uh, at 400 degrees because everything would melt. In fact, the material that we use, polyethylene, would actually degrade at those temperatures. And we came across a study describing the possibility of annealing the signal in phosphate glass by ultraviolet radiation, UVC in particular. And the study showed that a progressive reduction in the radiophotoluminescent signal is possible by using, in fact, UVC exposures. This, of course, would avoid the need for heating of the uh, materials that we develop, and in principle would be suitable to anneal and therefore reuse those films. So we uh, set out to test the response of the glass to a variety of UV light sources including LEDs, fluorescent tubes, and high-intensity lasers, lasers used for uh, multi-photon absorption studies. We started with LEDs. Uh, we started with one emitting 370 nanometer. Uh, that was the main peak, but not the only component, as I'll show you a uh, shorter wavelength, higher frequency and energy uh, emission is present. Uh, from these LEDs, we did observe a reduction in the signal, a progressive reduction in the signal. In this case, the uh, glass was exposed to UV light for five hours, and the spectrum of the signal, which was initially this uh, black line up here, progressively um, went down all the way to this uh, cyan uh, line that you see here. So clearly a fairly strong reduction, roughly 46% reduction after five hours of exposure to UV light. However, when we repeated the measurement the following day, uh, we saw that an increase of signal had occurred, which is the typical effect, a typical buildup effect that one has when exposing these uh, glasses to ionizing radiation. Now, as I mentioned, LEDs uh, emit a broad spectra of radiation and a fairly broad spectra of radiation, and typically they do have some contamination. As you can see here, this uh, LED in particular that has a nominal emission at 300 nanometers does have uh, components all the way down to 250, and that's a fairly common occurrence. We therefore repeated the study with sources, uh, fluorescent tubes, emitting again a main component plus some contaminant uh, lines in this case. The tubes were nominally emitting uh, 365, 370 nanometers, that's a UVA um, emission. As you can see, there are some components at uh, shorter wavelengths. Uh, a second tube, UVB, centered on uh, uh, 302 nanometers, produced the spectrum here, and once again, the contamination is even more pronounced. And finally, we had a UVC tube, whose spectrum uh, that we measured ourselves is shown here. This does have a 
prevalent emission at 254 nanometers, the main line that one can get from uh, a mercury-based uh, uh, tube. But again, several other lines, including lines at much shorter frequencies, uh, wavelengths, sorry, that is around 220 nanometers were present. So we exposed three pieces of glass to fairly high doses of these three types of UVC of UV radiation and looked at the signal. We also compared the signal to the one coming from a piece of glass that had been exposed to a quarter of a gray, 0 0.25 gray of uh, high energy X-rays. The signal had reached full buildup, so it was quite stable. These measurements are repeated over the course of two months and shown here. The measurements were done with a silicon photomultiplier. And what you see here are the measurements uh, acquired two months after the exposure. So once the uh, signal was extremely stable. And down here, you see the signal from the UVA and UVB exposed pieces of glass, which had received respectively 11 joule per centimeter per square centimeter of UVA. 18 joule per square centimeter of UVB. And here instead you see the signal coming from the piece of glass exposed to UVC radiation. In that case, the dose was 8 joule per square centimeter. And as you can see, in this case, there is a significant level of signal, which was reached after a clear buildup process, as expected. The signal coming from the piece of glass exposed to a quarter of a gray radiation is instead up here. So one can see that the signals are relatively close. Now, the way we interpreted this uh, was through looking at the elements that are present in the grass. So we uh, did a, um, a semi-DS analysis of the glass and we could find, as expected, these uh, components, these elements present in the composition of the glass. Um, oxygen dominates about 50% by weight, then it's about 30% phosphorus, about 10% sodium, and then aluminum, um, carbon. Interesting, there is uh, potassium at about 1%. These two elements are highlighted because they are some of those presenting the lowest ionization energy energies. Uh, this is the list of elements ordered by increasing ionization energies. And as you can see, potassium and sodium are among the light elements, those with the lowest ionization energies. Now, these values of ionization energies, of course, apply to single atoms. So once they are in the glass, the structure uh, will alter these values, but still the order of uh, uh, magnitude is quite interesting as it compares very nicely with the energy carried by 254 nanometer UV light, that is UVC light. So clearly UVC can cause ionization and therefore produce the signal that we had observed previously. And that is behind the creation of that signal and the slight contamination that is present also in the UVA and UVB sources is most likely the reason why there is a bit of an increase also in that case. The third study that we carried out was with a high intensity laser um, microscope that is used for two photon absorption studies. Uh, this was done at Yale. This uh, device has a tunable titanium sapphire laser that operates in the range for, from 680 nanometers to 1,080 nanometers. And it can measure fluorescent emission in four uh, color regions, so far red, red, green, and blue, simultaneously using non descant photomultiplier tubes. What we wanted to see was whether a multi-photon, a two-photon absorption um, was occurring and causing fluorescence in a piece of glass that had been previously exposed to 500 gray of photons of ionizing radiation. A glass, therefore, 
loaded with color centers. And what we observed was indeed the emission of orange light following stimulation with uh, highly intense 720 nanometer laser beams. And what we also saw was that by increasing the power of the laser beam stimulation, the fluorescence was emitted with the typical uh, power law, uh, so a quadratic dependence on the stimulating intensity as expected from true photon absorption. So this confirms that the absorption of two 720 nanometer photons is equivalent to the stimulation coming from 360 nanometer photons. That's a UVA photon that is known to produce excitation in irradiated RPL glass. The next thing we did was uh, taking a piece of glass that had not been previously radiated, so a pristine piece of glass, and exposing it to this high intensity beam, to the maximum possible intensity of the 720 nanometer laser light. We then allowed the glass to sit for 24 hours and then looked at it with our reader. And we did see the creation of color centers. This suggests that a three photon absorption had taken place in that case. And the absorption of three photons, three 720 nanometer photons, would then correspond to the absorption of a single 240 nanometer photon, which in turn carries 5.16 electron volts and is therefore able to cause ionization. So the study did confirm that UVC can cause ionization in RPL glass. It does initially remove some of the signal. It does initially cause some of the annealing that had been previously reported. So this study does not contradict previous studies. Unfortunately, the annealing is followed by creation of new signal. And the buildup only shows this with a delay of about one day. As a consequence of the study, we acquired quantitative evidence of true photon absorption and qualitative indications that three photon absorption may also occur. This is all quite interesting for a different type of applications, applications uh, of uh, photonic switching uh, type, where of interest is the uh, fast responding nonlinearities and low absorption that are provided by glasses. And where what's quite important is that the light is processed through an entirely optical uh, process without conversion to electronic form. So we believe and hope that the study has opened new possibilities. We would welcome your comments and questions, which you're invited to send us to the email addresses that were shown on the title slide. And we do thank you for your attention.